James Gilray, 1757 to 1815, A Fountain Overflowing with Joke. That's the title of my talk. That's rather a curious expression, uh, and I will explain it and where it came from uh, in the course of the talk. Uh, for the moment, I'll just say that it, it, it perhaps sounds slightly better and more appropriate if you say it with a German accent. All will be revealed in due course. James Gilray is rightly described as the father of modern caricaturists and cartoonists. A leading player and, certainly in my opinion, the greatest caricaturist of his age, who produced numerous outstanding images of politicians, royalty, international figures, and figures of fun. And one of the best and probably the most famous uh, of his caricatures was the plum pudding in danger. Um, many, most people, I suspect, are familiar with that image. Uh, it's reproduced uh, quite frequently. Uh, I'll, I'll go through the detail of it very shortly, but there's Pitt on the left uh, and Napoleon carving up uh, the world in their own, uh, um, on, on their own agendas uh, as to what they want. I've been a fan of uh, James Gilray and his work for many years. By profession, I'm a lawyer. I was a practicing solicitor for quite a number of years. Then I became a coroner uh, and subsequently became a judge in several jurisdictions, uh, and in particular in tax tribunals. So I, in my working life, I specialize in death and taxes, which <laughs> are the two certainties in life, aren't they, according to Benjamin Franklin. There wasn't much scope for humor in either of those occupations. <laughs> I, I do have a, a sense of humor. I'm also uh, very keen on fine art. So by uh, combining uh, um, my, my sense of humor with fine art, I arrived at the art of caricature, which I've been particularly keen on, uh, and began to collect the works of James Gilray and other uh, artists of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Gilray was a, a successor, a natural successor, really, to William Hogarth, who had begun to introduce humor into a, a classical style of engraving. Gilray and his contemporaries, James Sayers, Thomas Rowlandson, Isaac Cruikshank, George Cruikshank, um, George Woodward and Richard Newton and a few others, uh, developed a new style of, of immediate commentary on the affairs of the day, and in particular, they introduced hand-colored prints onto the streets of London, um, where they were appreciated by all sections of society, but it was generally only the comparatively wealthy who could actually afford to buy them. Now, I'm going to tell you just a very little about Gilray the man, the times in which he lived, uh, the politicians of the day, and his comments on the royal family, his attitudes in Napoleon and the French, uh, and I've got quite a, a large number of um, illustrations to show you. Uh, my immediate thanks here to Jeff Cowton, who has assisted enormously with, with taking the photographs and putting them in a form which can be projected to you. Of course, I can't cope with PowerPoints and techniques like that. Um, and, and thanks also to Melissa, who has uh, done the other half of transposing the photographs into the PowerPoints. So they, they've both been uh, a tire of strength in my preparation of this talk. Gilray was born in 1757. His father was a Scotsman who had come to Chelsea Royal Hospital after losing an arm at the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745. Um, his father was appointed a sexton of the Moravian Chapel in Chelsea, having become a member of the fiercely Evangelical Moravian Brotherhood in 1749. Um, uh, it, sorry, in 1749, young James, um, uh, was uh, uh, the only one of five children of the uh, Gilray household to survive uh, childhood. The family moved to the Moravian settlements at Millman's Row in London, uh, and young James was sent away to the Moravian Academy for Boys at Bedford at the age of five. That was evidently the age when you go away to boarding school in those days, so that was 1762. He will have been somewhat indoctrinated there, no doubt, by the Moravian philosophy, and he was taught to regard the world with ill-concealed horror. Children were filled with a sense of the worthlessness of life, and they were to view death as a glorious relief from earthly bondage. Death was to be welcomed, funerals celebrated, 
and Moravians passionately hoped not to recover from illnesses. So they're a strange, strange bunch. <laughs> Moravian schools were closed in 1764, probably due to financial difficulties, and one suspects that it wasn't altogether a popular form of education. Um, James returned to his parents in London at the age of seven. And, and little is known about any further education that he may have received from then on. But undoubtedly, he did receive education or tuition because, uh, as can be seen from his, uh, his art later on, uh, he displayed a particular range and depth of intellect and, uh, in his artistic work with frequent references to classical sources and biblical um, and Shakespearean uh, themes. He was described later in life as a well-informed, literate man who read a great deal. So it, it, it seems his somewhat eccentric education in the early years did him little harm. In his teens, Goray was apprenticed to a writing engraver who specialized in banknotes, certificates, and checks, which was a useful discipline for his later vocation as a maker of prints. But he soon became bored and in his teens, he left to join a company of strolling players and probably developed the rather bohemian tendencies evident in his later life. He returned to London, was admitted to the Royal Academy, where he learned much from classical engravers such as Bartolozzi. And in his 20s, he began to produce uh, his first prints. Initially, they were quite crude, um, depicting brothels, lavatory humor, and of rather limited demand. But he began to find his feet, and he tried his hand as a serious engraver in the style of Bartolozzi and the classical engravers. And this is an example of his early work. Um, there's nothing ostensibly uh, funny or, uh, about it. It's not exactly a caricature. It's an illustration to Tom Jones. It's Tom Jones, Partridge and the Beggar. Uh, very, very finely worked. In, uh, a lot of detail in it, and it's quite a clever work of art. Uh, and he produced a, a dozen or two prints in that kind of style uh, before finally um, devoting himself to caricature. That, that's quite a small print. It's only a, about six or seven inches high. But some of his uh, finest works uh, in, the, um, in his early style uh, were enormous black and white uh, engravings of shipwreck scenes and some sentimental scenes. Um, Gilray then went on, once he found his feet and developed his style and established his reputation as a caricaturist, to represent the major players of, of his age. Politics, there was Pitt, the Prime Minister, at 25, young man, as you'll know. Fox, Charles James Fox, the leader of the opposition. Um, and those two were totally different personalities. So let's begin to look at some of the illustrations of uh, showing uh, Pitt in the first place, and then Pitt and Fox, and then look at a few pictures of Fox. So uh, this was a very early uh, print produced showing Pitt on the left, uh, Thurlow, the um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and um, Warren Hastings in, in the centre there. Uh, feasting on the brains of George III. So it's rather uh, a curious and uh, I don't know about offensive, but uh, quite a curious print. But it's, it, it's his early style and the expressions in the faces are all very lively. Yeah. Pitt was tall and thin. And um, this is a fairly elementary uh, example of Gilray's humour, depicting Pitt speaking in the House of Commons, and uh, there it is. It's the bottomless pit, and uh, you see exactly what he's talking about. Um, and I don't know whether we can read. I, if there's a fundamental deficiency, why call for paper? So he had, in fact, said something like that in the House of Commons, not realizing the, uh, the, the, the inherent pun. And so Gary produced that. Yes, next. Hanging and drowning. Here we have the, uh, the two protagonists. We have the, the news had come through of um, a serious setback for the French because the country was almost constantly at war with the French in these days. And the French had had a serious setback. Um, it was thought that Fox was really quite, a, uh, quite sympathetic with the French and with the revolution 
and uh, he was considered, certainly by Gilray, to be thoroughly unreliable. Um, so at the news of the French defeat, there's Pitt celebrating in, in, in no small way with drinking himself silly with decanters and glasses of wine, red wine all over the place. Um, he's so happy at what's happened to the French, whereas Fox, in absolute despair, is, is wanting to hang himself. And likewise, in uh, a similar theme here, really, um, the tables turn. Uh, we have um, on the left, at the time when the French were on the offensive and seemed to be doing quite well, there's Fox depicted as the devil with the, the wings uh, and uh, uh, grabbing the thin, tall pit uh, and giving him grief. And then on the other hand, when uh, the French are being uh, defeated and uh, uh, chased away, there's Pitt got the upper hand and he's got Fox in his, gr in his grasp. Moving on now to one of Gilray's most famous uh, images, Uncorking Old Sherry. This is Pitt speaking in the House of Commons. And Sheridan, one of the leading opposition uh, politicians, had made a long uh, and rather tedious uh, speech um, but it was full of invective and uh, uh, offensive to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Uh, and so Pitt duly responded, and he's uncorking old Sherry. So Pitt's position and his attitude uh, had caused Sheridan, whose face is in the bottle, to uh, come out with all sorts of uh, inv invective there. And it was Pitt, Pitt who uh, provoked all of that. And all the opposition uh, MPs, uh, Fox, Tierney, uh, all, they can all be identified there with their bonnet rouge, because it was thought they were sympathetic to the French, sitting on the opposition benches. Yes. Go on the next one. Um, we missed one out. If we haven't, then we should have um, Midas transmuting all into paper. Yes, that's the one. Uh, another fine, fine, famous image. Um, this was uh, precipitated by um, the Bank of England uh, stopping payment of gold. Uh, until 1787, uh, anyone could go into the bank and uh, if you wanted to draw some cash, you were entitled to have it in gold. Um, and it was very much a working currency. Uh, well, the country began to run short of gold, uh, partly because of the expense of running the war against the French. And so the government uh, decreed that it was going to be permissible in future for money, for cash, to be paid out by the banks in notes, paper notes. Uh, this was greeted with great suspicion by the general public. And so here we find Pitt uh, in charge of all the, the gold there, a gorge with gold, but um, uh, making it into paper money is where it's coming out of his, his mouth there, and in fact coming from both ends. Um, and uh, the members of the opposition, uh, there's Fox there again, uh, all uh, kicked into touch out there. In, uh, uh, and Pitt, of course, is depicted as Midas. Um, but whereas Midas was transmuting everything into gold, this is transmuting everything from gold into paper. And Midas was given um, an ass's <coughs> ears by Apollo. So Pitt is also given those ears. But th there's a lot of other detail in that. I mean, you need all these prints, which. I haven't quite got the time to, to go into. Right, now can we have political ravishment. This, at the same time, really, um, a, a very famous uh, print. Um, Pitt, uh, again, uh, was thought that he was going for all the gold and all the gold coins in the Old Lady of Threadneedle Street's pockets. The Old Lady of Threadneedle Street uh, is, of course, the Bank of England. And this is political ravishment or the Old Lady of Threadneedle Street in danger. And so she is covered in the pound notes now. And it was this very print that gave rise to the expression, the old lady of Threadneedle Street, as a description of the Bank of England. Um, it, it, really, it misrepresents the position. Pitt wasn't uh, abusing the situation at all, but it made a good, it made a good joke. Right. That um, last print, uh, Political Ravishment, um, it, it, it is famous, and it can be adapted for all sorts of other... Uh, to, to other uh, uh, stories, uh, some years ago, when Mark Carney was appointed the, bank, uh, the manager of the Bank of England, 
Um, he said at the time uh, that, as far as he was concerned, he would propose that uh, bank rates should be kept at a particularly low rate and uh, tied down, and the Bank of England would no doubt comply. Um, there was thoughts at the time that we'll never get away with that. And so he's combining, uh, this is a contemporary uh, cartoon, and I regret that I forget who the artist is, but combining a few metaphors there, that the lady's not for tying. Um, so the cartoon has got that wrong, because bank rates stayed spread there uh, ever since. That was about 2012, I think. But there is Mark Carney trying to uh, tie the hands of the, uh, the Bank of England in keeping bank rates low. So as I say, got it wrong, but it's, it's taken from his after Gilroy, top right-hand corner. Um, this is one, or at, a, at a glance, one of Gilray's serious prints. Um, he, he had a, a after uh, his initial prints in, in about 1780 or so on a serious theme, um, about five or six years later, he had another go at trying to uh, be a serious artist. And um, he was commissioned by the publisher Samuel Forres to uh, do a, a serious picture, a serious print of William Pitt, um, which he's achieved. There's a huge amount of detail in that. Gilray complained at the time that the amount of work involved in creating this print was, he said it was driving me mad, um, getting all the detail right. Until you look up at the Pitt's face and the nose particularly, it, it's a fairly straight image of, uh, of a, a person of that period just sitting there at a the table. But Gilray couldn't resist the temptation of accentuating some of the facial features and the very, very almost Pinocchio-style nose. Couldn't resist it. As a consequence of that, the publisher um, refused to pay Gilray for doing the work, and he was really quite cross. Um, he tried again. He did a second print, but it was equally the, the slightly caricatured theme was there, and Forrest wouldn't have that either. So the whole incident left a very bad taste in Gilray's mouth and was one of the major factors in him saying, never, never again will I embark on anything like serious work. It's these hand-coloured, amusing caricatures that I'm going to spend my life doing. <coughs> this a, a, a fine and famous image um, insofar as there was a fear that I mean, Pitt was a, a good prime minister quite a popular prime minister uh, very powerful of course but there was a fear among certain sectors that uh, his exercise of power was going so far that he was almost uh, perhaps wanting to take over usurp the powers of the throne so you can see he's a, a toadstool growing out of the crown a simple image in many ways, and probably didn't take all that long to create on the copper plate, um, but a powerful one. An excrescence or fungus, a toadstool upon a dunghill. And a fine example of the caricaturist art here, Pitt, tall and thin, and a, a lady, Mrs. Hobart, who wasn't quite so tall and thin. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> A, a, a striking and memorable image. Well, this presages of the millennium. This is um, a big, big engraving. The, 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 most of Gilray's um, pr prints that you've been seeing, they, they measure about 10 by 14 inches. Um, that last one you saw, the uh, sphere projecting against the plane. It was half size, quite a small print. This is double size, uh, a, a big print, uh, and shows a pit, a wonderfully caricatured figure there, uh, grotesquely caricatured, but nevertheless, he, he, there he is on the White Horse of Hanover, um, triumphing over the opposition, the Fox, Sheridan, um, all, all, all the others, uh, being uh, trampled underfoot as he uh, rides over the uh, the swinish multitude here. A super, super prince. Yes. And then back to the plum pudding in danger. It's, it's generally said that this is the most famous um, uh, political caricature of all time. Um, and I said before, this country was at war with the French. Pitt, 
is um, a fine, fine caricature of his figure, carving the, the plum pudding, the globe, with um, a fork in the shape of a trident. And in fact, he's carving out, there, there's England, but carving out essentially nearly the best part of half of the world, but particularly the ocean and the colonies. That's, that's where his ambitions lay. Really. Whereas Napoleon is just helping himself to Europe. He'll just have the whole of Europe and slicing that off there. Um, it, um, it wasn't altogether fair that, that, that Pitt was so ambitious in that way, but there we are. And that's a, a fine, fine copy of that print, uh, the most sought-after uh, print by Gilray uh, that's lived on after his death. And that image also um, is reproduced and copied fairly regularly, and I'm sure many of you will have seen cartoons in, in modern newspapers uh, depicting that, that theme. If we could have the next one, please. Um, this was fairly recent. Um, the plum pudding days. We have uh, Ang Angela Merkel and uh, Putin. And uh, Putin is uh, he's already taken a, a bite out of Ukraine. He's, oh, he, he thinks he's just going to have it all. And that's it. End of story. And Angela Merkel is, is a bit powerless over that. But they were at the same title, the plum pudding in danger. The theme of the plum pudding in danger was copied by other artists at the time. This isn't uh, a print by Gilray. It's, 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 a, it's quite a clever print there. Um, and it's the turkey in danger because uh, here's Napoleon, a very curiously pic uh, pictured Napoleon. He looked nothing like that at all. And the artist is anonymous. Um, and this is, this, this is the only copy of the print that I know, so I, I can find very little about it. But uh, th that is Napoleon. And he was about to have a go at Turkey depicted by, uh, yes, you guessed, uh, uh, Turkey there. Um, and uh, Austria is being uh, trodden on below. Uh, and Napoleon is saying, it's hard to read here, but I've got it written down here, uh, must have the first slice of Turkey. Give me the mouth of Kataro. On the right-hand side over there, you have a British sailor. And he's looking after the plum pudding and the sirloin of beef. Symbol of Britishness, and he's saying, Boney, you're a little man, it's true, but you've got a most enormous moor. Devour Dutch cheese, Westphalia hams, German sausages, Italian ragouts, and Neapolitan macaroni, and you want another mouth to pick that turkey. But before you touch this sirloin and pudding you're squinting at, you shall just have a sop in the pan and a luncheon of forced meat balls that will make you squeamish about either. <laughs> so, so, there we are. What's what the public wanted, you see, they, they need to say they hated uh, Napoleon, but uh, identified very much with the, the sort of image of the, the English sailor, and what, what would be done to Napoleon if anyone got their hands on him. Let's move on to Fox. Um, Gilray produced, Gilray's depictions of Pitt were generally quite um, kind and sympathetic, because that was the way of his politics. And um, he wasn't keen at all on Fox, who was thought to have distinctly radical tendencies and was sympathetic to the French. Um, and so here we have uh, Fox. In some of the early prints, he was depicted as a fox with a fox's face. On this one, he's wearing a fox's um, skin and, and the, the, the head of the fox there and the, the feet, straddling the channel with one foot in France, one foot in England. Uh, and with a lead, leading the French fleet over to England to uh, no doubt come and conquer us. The Republican Hercules defending his country, hardly defending it. There it is. Again, Gilray not, not depicting Fox in a very kindly manner at all, um, uh, and that's just one insult added on to another in, in a pretty crude representation and Fox with blood on his hands, and uh, we'll say no more about that one. Uh, the Tree of Liberty, that, that again was uh, Giro's perception of the best place for Fox's head, um, and uh, at the foot of this, uh, this stake uh, are all the opposition politicians. Um, again, you have Sheridan there, Philip Comfort, because he was very close to um, Fox. So there we are. Um, and then finally, uh, 
fox is, is seen to be descending into the sour despond, sinking into a, a, a bog, as he sees he's failing to achieve the aspirations of the French at all. Right, um, moving on now to um, the French and Napoleon, which of course was um, a very important topic at the time, this country being at war with France. Um, this initial uh, insult to the French um, was in fact, there'd been an incident when uh, the Austrian army had routed the French army uh, and given them a good hiding. Uh, and so Gilroy has great pleasure in uh, showing what, uh, what he feels happened to the French at the time. You see a couple of French soldiers here who unfortunately lost their heads. And uh, the Austrians are quite happy about that. But uh, that's some um, wishful thinking on Gilroy's part. The French invasion, a clever prince, um, requires a little bit of imagination, but uh, you soon pick up what's going on. <laughs> um, you've got uh, George III there, and uh, there's his arm, you see, and he's lifting up his breeches. Uh, and France is depicted, you see, there's an old hag, an old, a, a face, uh, and getting it all in the face there. And it's French invasion, John Bull bombarding the bum boats. And so all the, the French boats are being forced back into uh, France. Um, quite a, a, a vivid and clever um, picture. Gilray didn't like the French. Here he compares a French gentleman at the court of Louis XVI, immaculately dressed in beautiful coloured robes, and bowing and uh, saying, I'm your humble servant. And then a revolutionary, a French gentleman at the court of Egalité, uh, 1789, uh, baiser mon cul, and uh, totally different uh, images. <laughs> so that's what he thought of the revolutionaries. The zenith of French liberty, this is a fine print. Um, there's a copy of this in the exhibition, Words of War and Waterloo, that Jeff has mentioned, uh, and it's a copy of this is reproduced in the, in the booklet to go with it. Um, Again, I mustn't spend too long on individual prints, but there's so much going on in this one. You see Louis XVI about to be executed here with a little, uh, with a quite reasonable depiction of the guillotine and the tricolor there. Um, a revolutionary sitting up there uh, playing a fiddle. He's, uh, a judge is being hanged there, a bishop being hanged here with his foot on the bishop's head, monks being hanged, um, and all the uh, bonnet rouge, the symbol of the French Revolution, in the crowd there down below. Um, it's, it's fairly freely drawn and sketched in, in the background, uh, is this print. But then these figures, here the face and, and the, the bishop and the monks, are actually quite, quite closely and carefully drawn. They're, they're caricatures with a lot of work gone into them. And it's not just a freehand sketch. Yep. Uh, the course can pest, again, this is in the uh, illustration booklet. This is very clear image of, of what uh, Napoleon's got coming to him. It's this the devil there with him on a pike and putting him over a, a fire. Um, Going to have him for supper. And some uh, fairly interesting verses down below which are mentioned uh, and reproduced in the, the booklet. So it's only about five minutes. Hmm? It's only about five minutes. Five minutes, right. I shall uh, <laughs> comply, don't worry. Um, right. Millet raving is just showing Napoleon there having a tantrum um, because he's upset at the English. Uh, and next one, the grand coronation procession of Napoleon. You'll see this illustrated if you visit the exhibition there it says that the Napoleon, the occasion of his uh, coronation, depicted very unkindly. His wife jo Josephine, even more unkindly. <laughs> and, uh, and there's the Pope looking rather suspicious and Talleyrand depicted unkindly with his club foot. Introduction of Citizen for Pone. This is Fox visiting Napoleon. Uh, Gilroy didn't like Mrs. Fox very much. That's, who, that's Mrs. Fox there. <laughs> um, and I think we'll skip a couple now if we can go on to Monstrous Crawls. That's again Napoleon. And that one you can see downstairs also. So come on, one more. Oh, on to royalty now. Um, the royal family were always considered. Um, uh, greedy, um, but on the other hand, 
including Queen Parsimonious and Cautious. Uh, and here we have the Prince of Wales and the, all three of them gorging themselves on, on gold coins. Yep. Scotch Harris News, that's just a lovely depiction of George III there, being happy about the defeat of the French recent, uh, the, uh, success in India, sorry. And then I think we'll go on fairly quickly. That's George III and Napoleon, yes, and the next one. George III who used to go out chatting to, young, to, to farmers and making a bit of a nuisance for himself. Um, here's a sentimental depiction of George defeating Napoleon. George III teaching his daughters to do without sugar in their tea. And if we move on, that's uh, an image. Uh, George, uh, the Prince of Wales, um, who'd separated from his wife, there was talk of a reconciliation. And so here he is um, uh, kissing his wife. They hadn't been reconciled at all, but Gilroy thought it was no less worthy of the prince. I think we'll go on, if we can go on fairly quickly, to uh, three or four, through the next three or four. These are all showing George, the prince, prince of Wales's bedroom habits, which you don't <laughs> want to hear about. So if we, if we, if we can go on, <laughs> the, the affairs that he was having... Um, so if we move on to one after that. That's, yes, that's an important print. Um, that had unintended consequences. Uh, the Prince of Wales and his wife uh, had just had a child. And um, Gilroy produced this uh, character of showing the members of the opposition, uh, Fox and Sheridan, the way they were greeting the child. That very print had the unlikely consequence that Gilroy was arrested and produced in the magistrate's court a few days later. Uh, the matter wasn't pursued, but um, it wasn't quite what he wanted. Uh, and um, temperance enjoying a frugal meal, George III being very miserly, and uh, all, there are so many features in this print. You could talk for 20 minutes about this print, about every, every little feature of it showing how cautious and miserly and impoverished the, the king and the queen were. And then the next one shows George IV, the Prince of Wales, um, bloated and gorging himself with all the, uh, the food and, and goodies he was used to. Uh, and that again being an image um, which is being copied uh, in uh, cartoons re uh, in more re recent time. An MP, a select committee an absentee under the delights of an expense account. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, uh, very recently, Seth Blatter gorging himself on the proceeds of corruption <laughs> in the football world. Um, nearly there, I think. That is a, a picture of, Gil of, of Hannah Humphrey's shop. Gil all Gilray's work was published by Hannah Humphrey, a print seller, and that's the, her shop with all of Gilray's pictures in, this, in the windows, uh, which uh, were very popular, and you've got people ranging from army officers and all their finery to little urchins looking at them in the street. And that is... Uh, that's a pair of little sketches um, by Gilray. Um, they're, they're sheets of paper about the size of your hand. But he would always carry around a little sketchbook with him and would um, draw, draw sketches of people in the street. Uh, and, and that's how they, they came out. And he'd colour them up at home. <laughs> I've rather run out of home. Um, and then just two or three images, a fairly lively image there of Earl Temple, who'd uh, stolen a lot of stationery and sealing wax from a government office. And so he's getting his come off because the ceiling wax melted. Um, love as hell. That, that's, that, that's quite pornographic. We've got to go move on from there. <laughs> the power of beauty. Someone who we didn't like. And then no exhibition by myself of Gilray's works will be complete without a quick look at Mary of Buttermere, a delightful little print of Gil that Gilray produced, um, unlike most of his caricatures. But there's Mary, the maid of Buttermere, and the story you may remember is that she was uh, effectively seduced and, and got married to this dreadful man, John Hadfield, who was a confidence trickster, an imposter, a forger, and he was eventually found out. But before all that, she was simply working in the pub in, uh, in Buttermere, and that's, that's a rather pretty little picture of her. That's all I've got time for.